In today's session, let's answer the question, is intermittent fasting pointless? Should you just restrict your calories? Is there any added benefit to compressing your feeding window, whether it's early time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting compared to just calorie restriction? We're gonna help answer and address that question because there's been several recently published studies that have sort of caused people to question whether or not there are added health benefits to intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding, including this recently published study in the New England Journal of Medicine. The title of this one was calorie restriction with or without time restricted eating in weight loss. Now, I think this study, there was, this was a year long study and there's some interesting aspects about this that often haven't been mentioned with regards to the lay press coverage of these two different studies. But in brief, this particular study was a year long. So it was quite interesting because this is a long duration study comparing again, continuous energy restriction with, con with a little bit of calorie restriction, but baked into a early time restricted feeding window, which I think the window in particular in this study was to adhere to this for an entire year. Uh, again, the New England Journal of Medicine article that we're gonna talk about, the feeding window was 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Imagine cutting off your feeding window every day for a year at 4 p.m. I'm gonna be honest. I mean, if I was enrolled in that study and I'm into this and I, I read this, I live this, that is very difficult. I'm just gonna put that out there as just like a, a variable that ought to be considered as compliance when comparing these two different interventions. I think it's a lot easier uh, to just sort of restrict your calories as opposed to cut your calories and don't eat anything after 4 p.m. What are you gonna do during the holidays? What do you do during the summer? What about Thanksgiving? Are you gonna have Christmas dinner at four? So we need to understand that eight to four can be utilized for a subset of the population, but to, to look at a study that compared eating from eight to four compared to continuously cutting the calories and then saying, well, there's no difference in time restricted feeding. So therefore forget it. Just, I think we need to pause and reflect, especially because what this study found is there was early on significant reductions, greater reductions in triglycerides and other related proxies associated with metabolic health. So we're going to talk about that uh, in more detail, but let's first start out with this study that many other people have been reviewing. Again, I'm presenting to you two different studies because folks like Lane Norton, who I have a lot of respect for, um, there, there's other people on the, on the internet that are pointing out, hey, see, these two studies show that there's really no added benefit to fasting, so just cut your calories. Now, that could be very true, but we need to look at the totality of evidence, not just two randomized studies. Now, this study, let's start out with this because I think the backstory about the investigators on this particular study Corey Rinders and then Victoria Cadenacci, they've published a lot of research with regards to time restricted feeding and feeding windows that is quite interesting that doesn't totally corroborate with their recently published study. And the title of this most recent one is Early Time Restricted Eating Compared with Daily Calorie Restriction, a Randomized Trial in, in Adults with Obesity. Now, this was just a 12 week study. Um, and again, I don't wanna jump all over the place, but I do just wanna give you a little bit of context again, about the authors of this study. It was published in the Journal of Obesity. It was initially published online, uh, I, I think in the fall, but it was just accepted in February of 2022. But um, I've been following these two scientists and their work for quite a long time. And because they published really interesting, like how they design their studies is quite fascinating. Like this study right here, this was published uh, in the journal uh, Nutrients in the subjournal MDPI. Late, late meal and sleep timing predicts higher body fat percentage. And I believe this study was exclusively in women, um, but I know for sure there was 83 individuals in the study. And what they found, again, these are the same scientists that published this, this study that we're gonna dive into, is when you eat your last meal was independently correlated with body fat percentage. And so what they found is that um, you need to eat your last meal within six hours of the midpoint of your sleep. So let's just make simple math. You go to bed at 10 p.m., you wake up at six the midpoint of your sleep would be 2 a.m. Subtract six hours out of that. So you really wanna stop eating at around 8 p.m. Now, individuals, for every hour that they ate that encroached on that midpoint of sleep was associated with a standard uh, increase in body fat percentage. And so that they talked about that in the details. Uh, I think it's like a 1.35% unit increase in body fat and so on. So it, what's interesting, again, I bring this up and I think this is, and you know, I think Lane would agree with this because these scientists have a sort of the bias towards time-restricted feeding. 
you know, because they've, they've published a lot of research on this, including another study titled Time Restricted Eating Plus Exercise Could Be Better Than Just One for Metabolic Health. Now, this was just a sort of a op-ed piece showing that, hey, if we can bake in exercise along with time restricted feeding protocols, we can enhance the health benefits. So I think that's interesting. But the most fascinating study, I think, that was published is about seven years ago now, um, was this study in the Journal of Obesity. A randomized pilot study comparing zero calorie alternate day fasting to daily continuous energy restriction in adults with obesity. Now, this was just a eight week study, but they tracked individuals and their metabolic rate for 24 weeks after the study ended. And so that's, I bring this up because this, what was interesting is, okay, let's just hold that thought. They, they looked at metabolic parameters 24 weeks after the study ended. Okay, that's a long-term follow-up of what happens after we end the diet. So it's important to look at like, okay, what happens when we're applying this intervention? But it's also important to recognize what happens after the intervention stops? What happens after the calorie cutting? Is there any difference between fasting and being in a deficit versus just continually being in a deficit, i.e. alternate day fasting versus c continuous energy restriction. What turns out that as this study found, again, the same authors, Corey Ridner and then Victoria Catanacci, they found that there was a difference. The people that continuously restricted their energy had a significantly reduced resting metabolic rate compared to the group that did the alternate day fasting. They also had other parameters that were different, uh, metabolically speaking. So I think, this is my bias, of course, if we just look at the short-term weight loss in these studies, but don't consider the post-study follow-up, and then what are also the metabolic parameters? What are the triglyceride reductions during the study, independent of weight loss? What about the liver enzymes? What about the glucose homeostasis and insulin? We should consider all of that, not just look at weight loss, okay? So that's my perspective. Now, we're gonna dive into this in more depth because there's some nuances that people often don't talk about. But first, friends, I do want to welcome you back. Thank you, for, as always, for being here. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thank you for subscribing. If you're enjoying the content, please hit, hit the like button and leave a comment below. Also, friends, if you're physically active, if you do fast, if you go in the sauna, you've got to check out our show sponsor, MyoScience. The new Electrolyte 6, what makes this product really unique is it has creatine, it has taurine, and real salt futured electrolytes, albion chelated minerals, potassium, a little bit of calcium, because a lot of people don't realize that electrolytes and creatine work synergistically to help support healthy hydration in the body and athletic performance. So if you're a gym goer, if you like to walk, if you like to do yoga, check out many of the reviews. I think there's close to 200 reviews at this particular point of filming this content. Just want to read to you. Um, Nicole recently said, you know, I've been following Mike on Instagram for a while, decided to try the Electrolyte 6 because I share on Instagram stories. She said, they are so good. I love the taste. I've tried many Electrolyte supplements. This one does not make my blood sugar go crazy. Look, a lot of Electrolytes have sugar in them and have a lot of like synthetic sweeteners and stuff like that. Trying to stay away from that with Myoscience. Um, and she goes on to say, this one does not make my blood sugar go, go crazy. And she wears a continuous glucose monitor, a CGM. Um, and she says, great taste, great hydration. So you can check out the reviews. If you decide it's something you want to embark on, 30-day money-back guarantee. These are little travel-friendly sticks that you can uh, bring anywhere on your summer vacation, you know, wherever you are. So you can use the coupon code podcast over at myoscience.com. M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience.com. Check it out. So let's dive into the study. Sorry to be all over the place. I just want to break down these studies, but I, I had to give you that background and perspective. So we are talking about a comparison between early time restricted feeding versus daily calorie restriction. And the study conclusion was that essentially calorie restriction within a feeding window wasn't, wasn't any better than continuous energy restriction. And they actually say it was not an acceptable dietary strategy resulting in similar, similar levels of adherence and weight loss compared to just daily calorie restriction alone. Again, in layman speak, that is that the study conclusion doesn't support energy restriction and time restricted feeding. It actually suggests that possibly just restricting your energy is better, okay? But here's the challenge with this particular study, I would just say. This was conducted during COVID. Just, it's worth considering this. These are part of the logistics. And so therefore, some of the DEXA scans of body composition was actually not recorded. As they say here, owing to COVID-19 related interruptions, week 12 DEXA scans were not performed in the cohort. So we really need to understand like, okay, BMI changes, changes in the scale, right? 
those are important, sure. But we really wanna know what's the body compositional changes when people un embark on a lifestyle intervention, whether it's fasting or calorie restriction. Like, is one group preserving more lean mass than the other, right? And if so, what are those compositional changes? And, and unfortunately, we don't have that. Now, I'm not saying that that this, this one finding alone means that the study is bunk. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying these are things we gotta consider and probably other people haven't talked about. Now, what do the authors say in their conclusion? They say, we evaluated the acceptability and efficacy of a 39-week weight loss intervention using early time-restricted feeding plus calorie restriction compared to just calorie restriction in adults with overweight and obesity. Whereas the majority of short-term studies that have found metabolic benefit associated with time-restricted eating have used early windows, most free-living studies of TRE um, have allowed participants to self-select eating windows to increase adherence, meaning that people can figure out, okay, what's my best eating window, right? Is it, am I an early eater or do I fast all day and eat later, okay? However, we sought to determine the acceptability of a prescribed early eating window within the context of behavioral weight loss intervention. Overall, we found that early time-restricted eating plus calorie restriction, those are, uh, that was the intervention, was acceptable with no differences in attendance, attrition, or self-reported adherence between the group that just restricted calories. However, there's something that I think is important that they say. In this trial, we provided calorie goals to both groups, but in the early part of the study, we found participants in the feeding window compression and calorie restriction group had difficulty focusing on both calories and eating windows, right? Because you, you take someone who doesn't even know what a calorie is or what protein is, and you're like, well, you not only need now to track your macros and your energy, but you need to do all that in a confined period of time. They're like, oh man, like this is a lot for me to do. Like I've never done this before, right? So, so they said they had some challenges. I mean, literally they said that this group had difficulty focusing on both calories and feeding windows. So let's just hit the pause button right here and say, it should be okay, like, hey, if you wanna lose weight, we do now know that intermittent fasting is a tool. If you would like to go that way and just compress your fitting window and not overanalyze how much food you're eating, that's a tool. But if you're a tracker, you like your macro calculator, you like spreadsheets and scales, then you can just cut calories. This, there's different strokes for different folks. And I think we need to understand and appreciate that there's different ways to go about this. But I think we can all recognize that you need to get into a deficit of some sort in order to lose fat, okay? Anyway, so they go on to say that participants in the early time restricted feeding group plus the calorie restriction arm reported greater adherence to eating within their windows compared to eating at or below their calorie goals. So what they actually found is that it was easier just to eat during a confined period of time as opposed to hitting the macros that needed them to become in a deficit. So adherence was hard to do both. And I think, I think that's true for a lot of people. And maybe the people that naturally get benefits from fasting are sort of, you know, they have a hard time tracking. So that's why they choose to fast as a modality to get into an energy deficit to uh, cause weight loss. And so I think if we just look at these studies and say, see, fasting sucks, it doesn't work. It's like, well, for some people, as the scientist literally said, there was greater adherence to just compressing the feeding window compared to also, you know, trying to stay in a deficit. So I think, you know, we can all recognize and appreciate one way to get into a calorie deficit uh, is just to eat your food in, in, in a confined period of time. It's easier to do that for some people. And they actually uh, found that. But again, well, I think it's important to look at other factors, not just the weight loss. Again, and as we saw here, as the authors recognized because of COVID related restrictions, we couldn't also look at body compositional changes, DEXA scans, and body fat percentage. But there were uh, interesting, and these were not a p-value of 0.01, p-value of 0.3, and 0.18, but if you look here at the overall triglyceride reduction in, in the two different groups, and I know that, again, as they acknowledge, there were more challenges in the calorie restriction paired with uh, time-restricted feeding compared to just the calorie restriction group. But if you look here at figure B, and uh, I'm more of a fan of looking at triglyceride reduction. We know that blood triglycerides are a reflection of poor metabolic health, of insulin resistance. And if you look here, again, the p-value is just 0.18. So if you were to reproduce this study a thousand times, you would get this result 800 times roughly, maybe not 999 times, but what you see here is overall a more significant reduction 
in blood triglycerides. And again, we know that triglycerides are independent proxy for heart disease. We know that triglycerides reflect poor metabolic health. And so I'm, I'm more interested in looking at weight loss and improvements in metabolic health and improvements in blood sugar parameters and liver enzymes. So I think that's quite interesting. So there are other futures and tables that, that we can talk about here, but I think it's important to consider the, the bigger picture and what's going on metabolically uh, as well. So there was that study and many people have looked to this study. Uh, look, humans, we naturally fall into these tribalistic camps, right? If you believe that um, body fat percentage is just a, a, a reflection of um, you know, excessive energy consumption uh, and insufficient exercise, you're going to look at the study and say, see, you suck, fasting sucks. But if you're also looking at, well, we know that um, you can be in a calorie deficit and you can still have poor metabolic health. Uh, you can have insulin resistance, right? So we need to look at the bigger picture. And so we can look at the study and say, well, yeah, there, maybe the study shows that there's not that much added benefit to time-restricted feeding. Um, and however, we also need to consider those other factors, uh, changes in metabolic parameters, greater reduction in triglycerides, and so on. And so that's what I think is quite interesting as we sort of shift gears now and talk again about this other study that was published in April about a month ago. The title is Calorie Restriction with or Without Time-Restricted Eating and Weight Loss. And again, what was interesting about this study is this study was a year long. It's, it's hard to find studies that have been conducted this long, but I think what I would like to do here is focus on what's going on here in table three. And I would like to bring your attention to, again, the triglyceride reduction, because this is where I think it tells the story about, hey, is there any metabolic difference here? And if you look here, the between group difference, there, there was, especially early on when compliance was probably higher, as I mentioned, the study in the New England Journal of Medicine was a year long. It was conducted in China, telling individuals that they must stop eating at 4 p.m. every day for a year. That's tough business. And I, I'm in this thing, and I'll tell you, you know, being social, having a kid, I can never stop eating at four. I can do it a lot of days, maybe 40% of the time, 50%, but not every single day. But you can see when you enroll people in the study, they're gonna be most compliant early on. And what this found is that what the, what the table here, table three shows, is a much greater uh, drop in triglycerides, especially during the first six months. And so you see here a 44% reduction in triglycerides in the time-restricted feeding group versus a 31% reduction in triglycerides in the uh, calorie restriction group. And then you can go on and look at also improvements in HDL. So you would expect if your metabolic health was improving, you would see an increase in HDL and you do indeed see that. The between group difference, you know, we're not talking about massive numbers here, 1.6% uh, difference. So there was a 4.2% a 4.2 uh, point increase in milligrams per deciliter in HDL in the time restricted feeding group versus only a 2.7% increase. Um, and then if you look here also at glucose, there was a greater reduction in the group that did time restricted feeding versus continuous energy restriction. And then also there was the uh, insulin deposition index um, and that was significantly uh, improved more so in the time restricted feeding group. So again, when people say, see, I told you fasting sucks, it doesn't do anything. Well, let's, let's, look at body weight and let's also consider the other parameters because it's not just the body weight that is the problem it's poor metabolic health and so if we can allow people to self-select for a feeding strategy that they can adhere to that they like and they enjoy and that also has potentially added metabolic health improvements and benefits i.e triglyceride reduction hdl increases better improvements in glucose handling then that would be great right so that's essentially what this study was looking at. And they say, you know, in conclusions, among patients with obesity, a regime of time-restricted eating was not more beneficial with regard to reduction in body weight, body fat, or metabolic risk factors than daily calorie restriction. So when you read the conclusion, if you just read the abstract, you say, see, calorie restriction is best. Don't bother with fasting. The way that I look at this is, is hey, different strokes for different folks. Do what you can what you like, right? Weightlifting is good for every, for most people, but some people don't like to lift weights. So if you like to do yoga, then do yoga. Do you don't have to lift weights, right? As long as we give people options and tools and let them know 
that it, that it looks like, hey, time-restricted feeding it may not be better than calorie restriction, but it's a tool that can get you, get you, you know, equal benefits in terms of fat loss and then also uh, in terms of potential metabolic improvement. So that's my perspective is we come from different, we're different ethnicities, different social connections, uh, work obligations, family structures. We should have the flexibility to do what works for us. So that's just my perspective. But I do want to thank individuals like Lane Norton and other people who are challenging uh, conventional dogma and, and causing us to dig deeper into these uh, different studies to look at the subtleties and the details. It's good that we have conflicting perspectives. It causes both parties to dig deeper and to better understand where other people are coming from and to look deeper at the studies. And I think that's important, friends. So what do you think about this information? What are some of the benefits that you've experienced with fasting? Let me know in the comment section below. That goes a long way. Thanks for sharing this video. Thank you for hitting that like button. And we'll catch you on a future one down the road. Bye now.